In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We go to 1 Samuel chapter 5, and I have to tell you that you know, within the Old Testament, there's often a lot of humor. Uh, and when, when you look at the Hebrew text especially, you can see the irony, the humor. And in this case, you have a little bit of that. You have a little bit of irony, you have a little bit of humor, and you also see the holiness of God. And so what happens in 1 Samuel chapter 5? The Philistines had just done the unthinkable. They captured the Ark of the Covenant. And if you go back and look at the video on chapter 4, it talks about how Eli and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. It's a real example of bad news. And right when the, the news of the Ark of the Covenant being taken away came to the high priest Eli, he fell backwards and he died. Uh, and then his daughter-in-law gave birth to a son, and the name of the son was Ichabod, Ichabod or Ikavod, which means without glory. The glory has departed, underlining that the ark had been taken away. It doesn't get worse than that. However, chapter 5 is very interesting because you see how God suddenly begins to fight against the Philistines. And so let's go to chapter 5 and let's see what happens. And really, it's almost like a, a biblical game of hot potato. If you remember that game, hot potato, where you would pretend like it was there was something that was a hot potato, like a ball or something else, and you just toss it back and forth as fast as you could. Well, you really have almost a biblical game of hot potato going on here. Very humorous in a certain sense, where the ark is being passed from one Philistine city to another Philistine city. There's five Philistine cities all together. And so, and finally they say, we don't want this thing, send it back to the Israelites. So let's go to the biblical text and let's just read the text first before we go through the notes here. And it says in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5, it says, when the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they carried it from Eben Azer to Ashdod. Ashdod is a Philistine city. It's on the coast you can go visit it today in Israel. And it goes on and it says, Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up besides Dagon. Dagon was a Philistine god. Literally the word Dagon, it comes from the word dog, which means fish. And Dagon is like saying the big fish, okay, or the great fish, you know. So I like to um, call it the big fish, okay? So they take it to the house of their god, Dagon, the great fish or big fish, and they set it up there near their god. So let's see what happens as God begins to fight against the Philistines. Verse 3, it says, When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So their god was suddenly on the ground, almost like, God was saying, you know, your God is nothing compared to our God. It, and it's almost like the implication is like prostrating himself before the Ark of the Covenant. So it's it's underlining that the God of Israel is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and all gods are, all so-called gods are subject to him. And so Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. What's really interesting is the Philistines, they were a people who were good at sailing, fishing. So they were a sea people, okay? And so they were very good uh, at, you know, as a sea people, you know, so they their cities were near the ocean, whereas the Israelites lived inland. And so the great Philistine cities, there were five of them, they were all close to the coast because they were a sea faring people. So you can understand their god Dagon, the big fish, a seafaring people, you can see the connection there. So they, it says in verse 3 that they took Dagon and, and put him back in his place. And when they rose early in on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen uh, face downward on the ground. Look at the image. It's almost like he's prostrating before the God of Israel. On the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both of his hands were lying cut off upon the threshold only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. And so it's almost like he's been decapitated in a, in a certain sense. You know, his head and his hands are cut off. And um, it underlines how, you know, this so-called God is useless to you. Uh, you can go to Psalm 135, and it talks about how the gods of the Gentiles are nothing. 
And so verse 5, it says, this is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon. Um, let's go here. I'm sorry, lost my verse here. Verse 5, this is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. And that note is really important because it implies, it implies that, you know, this is really being written at the time period here. Because otherwise, why would you have a cultural note? like that if this was written centuries after the Philistines were not even in the land. Um, and so verse 6, it says, The hand of the Lord was heavy upon the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors. Uh, the word for tumors could be translated as hemorrhoids or tumors, so you might see different translations uh, in the biblical text. Both Ashdod and its territory. So everybody around Ashdod and its territory, they're afflicted with either these tumors or hemorrhoids. And you can just imagine them thinking, what in the heck is going on here? Verse 7, and when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must remain with, uh, <clears throat> must not remain with us, for his hand is heavy upon us, upon Dagon our God. And it's like they're realizing that the God of Israel he, he's superior to our God. And in ancient Near Eastern cultures, all warfare was essentially tied to this concept. Our God is superior to your God if we win. And so the Philistines had just beaten the Israelites in a battle. They had just captured their ark. But they're suddenly realizing, you know what, there's something wrong with our theology here. Their God is showing that he's superior than our God, even after we won this battle. And so uh, they're realizing something that, that um, for ancient Near Eastern cultures, this was very important. And so they brought the Ark of God of Israel, the Ark of the God of Israel there. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord of the city, city was against the city. So what are they doing? They're, they're going to play this game of hot potato, okay? And so... Um, Let's go, let's go to uh, verse 9. At the very end of verse 9, it says, Causing a very great panic, and he afflicted the men of city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. And so they sent the ark of God to Ekron. So they're sending it from one city to another city. If you go to uh, the beginning, okay, it says that first he afflicted the people in Ashdod, okay? And then he's, he's afflicting them in Ashdod. So what do they do? They send the ark to Ekron in verse 10, okay? And so the people of Ekron are crying out. They have brought around us the ark of the God of Israel to slay us and our people. And they sent, therefore, and gathered all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of God of Israel and let it return to its own place, that it may not slay us or our people. Okay, so you can see what's going on here. There's like this biblical game of hot potato. So let's take a look at our notes here. So we go through the notes, and first and foremost, the ark was taken to Ashdod. It's a city right on the coast, and you can go visit it. It's in the south of Israel. It's a, kind of like a beach town this day. It reminds me a lot of cities in Southern California in a certain sense, located right on the, the, uh, the, west, the west coast of, of uh, Israel. And so, of course... Um, you know, it, there, it's like a three-day period. First, they bring the ark in, uh, and then the people, the, the the people raised up Ashdan, their statue, after he had fallen down. the The incident occurred on the second day, and then on the third day, the statue of, of Dagon is found again. But now it's decapitated. The head is cut off, and the hands are cut off. So you can see, like on the third day, it's like get there's something wrong here, and the people are being afflicted with tumors or hemorrhoids. And so the, uh, the second city they sent it to was the city of Gath, okay, which is another Philistine city, okay? And when they sent it to Gath, there's a great confusion. The people break out with tumors or hem hemorrhoids, and then they sent it to a third city, the city of Ekron. And, and so by the time it gets to Ekron, the people are crying out, um, you know, that essentially what they're saying, the final decision is it will cause to die me and my people. What's really interesting about this um, it's right around verse 10 or 11. I don't have the verse here in the notes. Uh, it's like the Philistines are speaking in the first person singular, almost like you're going to wipe out the Philistines if we don't get this ark out of here. So there's a little, it's a little theological here uh, in the sense that it's like God is, is 
afflicting all of the Philistine people here because they've taken the ark. And so what's the final solution? The final solution is that in time, the Philistines realize that they need to rid themselves of the ark. So they send the ark back to Israel pulled on a cart of oxen. Remember that nobody was able to touch it. There were poles that had to be put through the ark. The priest couldn't even the priest couldn't touch it. They had to put these poles through it and lift it up by the poles that were that were put through the ark. It had little rings attached to it. Uh, it was a rectangular box about you know, basically one and a half feet by four feet long and one and a half feet high. And so on the very top, there was a cover with two cherubim bowing down. And so the Philistines are going to send it on a cart being pulled by oxen. This is very important to understand uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, another book later, because when the ark is finally brought back to Israel, um, the Israelites make the mistake in 2 Samuel chapter 6 uh, of not having the Levitical priest carry it the way that it's supposed to be carried. And it looks like it's going to fall off the car cart. One of David's friends, Uzzah, he reaches out and touches the ark, and he's struck down dead right at that moment. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And so when David finally brings the ark back to Israel in 2 Samuel chapter 6, he does it the right way. He has Levitical priests carrying it, and he's offering sacrifices every six paces. Can you imagine all the sacrifices being offered? So here we see the Philistines sending it away. And so this is a narrative that endures. It's a trajectory in the narrative that endures all the way to 2 Samuel chapter 6 when it is brought back to Israel. And the importance about this is that when it's finally bought, brought back, it's brought to the city, finally, of Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. And in the city of Jerusalem, uh, David leads the ark into Jerusalem as he's acting like a king and a priest. He puts on the ephod of a priest, which is a garment only wore, worn by the priest. And so it's a very important theological moment when it's finally brought back because you see David acting as a priest and a king. And this helps us to understand the expectations tied to the monarch, which are going to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ our Lord, who's priest, prophet, and king, par excellence in the most perfect way. And so um, the whole scene of the ark being set, sent away from the Philistines on a cart being pulled by oxen, it's very important to understand when the ark finally returns. And you have to go all the way to the next book, 2 Samuel chapter 6. But we will get there eventually. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.